as far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be invisible. Human beings always dreamt of flying, breathing underwater, or disappearing. Even nowadays, the interaction between reality and mind is a mystery, and the quest is not over. Wizards, scientists, and artists have discovered tricks to fool the eye-brain interaction. As a part of creation, we are now empowered to create our own ghillie suits and blend in with nature. Good morning folks, here's the covert sartorialist and today we're gonna talk about Gen 4 Gillies. What for? Well maybe this is one of the reasons. This is Hessian jute. It has been wet, frozen during the night and do you think that I can stack it back in my rucksack? No way. But is it to say that Hessian jute is useless? Certainly not. It's almost five o'clock. Let's make tea. Stealth behavior is the first 50% of concealment. Even if you wear the best Gen 4 ghillie suit in the world, you need to behave as if you were wearing OD greens or khakis. Do not rely on your camouflage to be unseen. Perception is a relation between the subject and the object. So in our case, between the observer and the object. What does the observer see? Where does the light come from? Where is the sun? Where is my shade? Do I look darker or brighter from where the observer is? And maybe the most important question, what's behind me? 
what am I trying to blend into? The skills and the awareness of the observer or the hunter force are more relevant to your detection than your camouflage. Camouflage is like real estate. Three things really matter. Location, location, and location. This grasshopper was green a few weeks ago. He did adapt to the environment and now perfectly disappears. So how did I see him? Because of movement, obviously. But as soon as you zoom out and he remains still, detection becomes impossible. Forget about identification. The good feeling you have with 3D is this impunity. Just don't see your head. So the name of the game is be still, don't move. If you don't move, you will go undetected. So here's the danger zone. Yeah, this thing looks like a looks like a ghillie. So this is a good spot, we protect it from the right. The first rule of 3D camouflage is get the right 2D base layer. 
Let's make a vehicle metaphor because uh, you see, this vehicle is legit. It has been built for short distance runs. And you would probably not go on the Autobahn in Germany with this, right? But uh, if uh, we had to consider that this is a ghillie suit, would you say that ghillie suits are made only for short distances? No, they're just like vehicles. You will not build the German Autobahn for this kind of vehicle. And in the same way, the world is large. And if you want to be unseen on the top of this hill, you will need a long distance camouflage. This is why, first of all, I want my camouflage to work on long distances. And then I check for short distances. If you do the other way around, well, you will end up with this on the German Autobahn. Or, in ghillie terms, you will end up with plastic plants on a Russian army uniform uh, pushed by some YouTuber, if you know what I mean. And if you want to learn 2D, think big and kick ass. That's the kind of stuff you have to practice with. Large pieces of material. Do it macro and test it from afar. dried for like uh, half an hour and now we begin field testing this 2d pattern and uh, oh it's not bad I would add some uh, some gray and I think it will be fine yeah well so you see from a close distance it looks very gray but when you move away it's still not great enough. What you see from 5 meters is not what you see from 50 and it's not what you see from 500. Okay. Okay, that's not bad. So this is our 2D base layer. And now, only now, is it worth to add 3D, which is costly, time consuming, and you better not add 3D to uh, junk base layers as uh, Chinese pajamas and other shit. To the contrary, I would recommend using high quality base layers, such as this one we're testing here with 2D Grandmaster Julien. And moreover, if you want to disappear on a flat surface such as rocks, you barely need 3D since it's flat. So the amount of 3D could be very high with high density 3D. This is what we see here. It's intended for short distance in woodland. Or maybe you rather need mid density 3D where the interaction with the 2D base layer is stronger and it will be less bulky in your backpack. But if you're operating in uh, special forces and you're already wearing 50 kilos of gear in your uh, Bergen, you want your ghillie to be as light as possible. And this is when you rely on very good 2D, such as MimTech, and you will need less 3D to get the effect. What is a Gen 4 ghillie suit? Obviously, it's what I'm wearing. But if there is a Gen 4, there must be a Gen 1, Gen 2 and Gen 3. Well, first of all, what is a first generation ghillie suit? It's a system with a net, a netting like fishing netting, that is glued or sewed to a, to a base layer, usually a uniform. And then you attach jute 
by by doing knots and this is a gen 1 ghillie suit gen 1 ghillie suits tend to snag on branches mechanical devices and jute can become very heavy and cumbersome but it has a nice negative space effect and it's aesthetically very pleasant as you all probably know the word gilly comes from scottish mythology from the legend of gilly do uh, a young uh, dark-haired boy who lives in uh, birch trees and uh, this word is now universally used for any camouflage uh, 3d camouflage outfit whether it's uh, gen 1 gen 2 and gen 3 uh, historically they were used by uh, people who wanted to catch poachers and we all know uh, Lord Lovat of course Simon Fraser uh, from World War One to World War Two, the British Army used this in uh, in combat, and nowadays uh, almost every sniper school requires you to make a Gen One ghillie suit. They're used in training. You have to get familiar with them, and uh, they perform well in grass environments and um, anything that is negative space. Uh, it works uh, quite well. Uh, of course, it's uh, it's very heavy. Uh, it's it's not easy to pack, and there are many shortcomings of the the Gen One system, and this is why Gillies have evolved uh, with with other generations uh, with improvements and evolution. One important thing about Gen One is that usually you have to use it with vegetation, so you. You rarely use it like like in uh, Scot Scottish Highlands because if you want to add green, uh, you have to add vegetation, and this is how it's taught today. It's even even uh, it doesn't make sense to use a Gen One without vegetation, according to what I have heard in, in sniper schools and other special forces training. So relying on vegetation is something I don't like. Uh, during the Vietnam War, it was told that uh, it will wilt within four hours. Yes, it will wilt within four hours, but it will also break if you sit in a vehicle, if you do anything. So it, it, it reduces mobility, it it's, uh, reduces autonomy. And personally, uh, I don't like to rely on vegetation. Of course, if it was a matter of life and death, I would do use it. But... The, there is a thin line between camouflage and cover-up. If if you just use branches to cover up or leaves to cover up, it doesn't make sense to wear camouflage beneath. You could be dressed in civilian clothes. So why have three or four layers of clothing to reach uh, no result, nothing? Because you will rely on vegetation at the end of the day. Relying on the vegetation for your personal concealment is always a double-edged sword because the angle of, of the leaves, the, like you see on this on this picture, this branch doesn't look natural and it, it may fool an animal, but it will not fool a sniper looking for you with magnifying optics. And um, the thing is that it can uh, it can move it can it it can move and if you remember those old World War Two German sniper uh, sniper instructions sniper school um, movies I think you can find them on YouTube uh, they they explain that it's 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 not a good idea because one small movement of you with the fulcrum of the branch ten centimeters you move will be maybe twenty thirty centimeters of movement of the branch. And this will get you detected for sure and from afar. So, vegetation, mm, yes and no. But I would like to emancipate myself from vegetation when I do camouflage. And this is the first trade-off in, in, in the science of personal concealment. You have to choose between mobility and cover-up. 
if you like the grids to insert vegetation you will have more performance more security but you will be condemned to uh, to crawl and to make small movements so it's it's a sniper approach and it's not something that's good for recon and i'm a recon guy And in the 1990s, some recon-minded guy had a clever idea. Uh, it was to make a new generation of 3D camouflage suits, which I call Gen 2, uh, that are made with zigzag garlands, and uh, these are then sewn to a, to a mosquito mesh base layer. This is the cheapest one you can get. I got this one for $16 in Hong Kong. This is a more expensive one, like 80 euros on ASMC uh, Germany. So you see the, the mosquito netting is transparent, so it doesn't, doesn't give you complete camouflage and it's quite fragile. Gen 2 ghillies are also referred to as zigzag suits because of the zigzag shapes. So uh, you had expensive ones like this one, the Caramore Chameleon, which I had, or super cheap uh, Chinese junk. But uh, the first one I got was in the 1990s. It was from U.S. Cav in, uh, in Texas, and uh, it was very lightweight, but it didn't offer much camouflage, and sometimes it was even counterproductive. If you check on the internet today, you have so many sorts of Gen 2s on the market and most of them will give you less camouflage than a good 2D. For example, on this picture, we can see two, uh, I think, French army operators who are who would have been better off wearing uh, camouflage centre hop. Jack Pike was another brand offering zigzag suits. And then you had this awful outer do Chinese stuff. So you, you can see many mistakes on this. The flip flaps which flap in the wind and parallel shapes. It's, it's not good camouflage. It's not good, but it's cheap and some can shill it just as a pure money spinning operation like a cash grab. Of course, you also have professional uh, Gen 2 ghillies, such as the ones made for the, for the French army, but still I think the performance is disappointing compared even to a good 2D. The third generation of ghillie suits appeared in the early 2000s when uh, the military industry began applying its high-tech solutions to, uh, to ghillie suits, to personal concealment. So they had the solutions to conceal uh, tanks, observation posts, antennas, uh, missile launchers with uh, multispectral camouflage. That is camouflage that can work in the ultraviolet, uh, visual, so naked eye spectrum, and also the near-infrared spectrum for night vision, but even uh, far-infrared, thermal-infrared for um, uh, flare detection. They applied this technology to, uh, to personal concealment with such emblematic milestones uh, like the SOTAX. Uh, the SOTAX was really a, a big thing uh, back in the days. And um, it was it was a, a great uh, leap forward with uh, more realistic colors, at last uh, ref, uh, reflectance uh, being addressed, but the geometry was poor with the V-shaped leaves, uh, repetitive patterns. Uh, it was it was not not the best from a naked eye perspective. So it still could be improved. And even though it was a, a big scientific success, it was not a commercial success because I have seen them in, in, in some special forces, some recon units, but it seems uh, 
they they didn't sell well and and it also seems they were discontinued because this year at Eurosatori, uh, the Sotex was not in the in the Sab uh, Barracuda catalog anymore. Even though BRICS and other third world countries came up with lousy copies, of course, copycats are, are everywhere. It's hard to stop them. But let's think back. Let's go back to the roots of of Jennifer logic. So. Uh, Back uh, in uh, in World War II era, you already had Russian uh, snipers uh, who got uh, issued the uh, ghillie suits, which were made of 3D directly attached to a uniform. So this is the oldest uh, Gen 4-like logic that I, I, I have found. And honestly, I have discovered this only after inventing gen 4 <laughs> so i thought i was uh, i was a, a great innovator but then i discovered that something uh, similar had already been done in in world war ii uh, during the vietnam war like this north vietnamese army helmet with uh, u.s army uh, parachute uh, green uh, green leaves and when you think about it even the the great carlos hathcock who was the most uh, uh, well-known and, and, and famous uh, United States Marine Corps sniper didn't use a, a Gen 1. He rather used a, a leaf net, a synthetic leaf net, and then he added some uh, some jute and some small 3D elements to the to the leaf net. So this was also like a, like a Gen 4 intuition, even though it was not modular, even though he didn't have perfect uh, pattern control. But anyone who comes, uh, who tackles this question of personal concealment in the field, with some uh, with with some uh, uh, battlefield expedient materials, will come to the conclusion that you have to adapt the colors, geometry, the shape, and uh, uh, and the the overall aspect of the of the suit to your environment if you apply this logic you understand that the suit is maybe not necessary that you could attach 3d directly to your helmet to your backpack to your uniform to your rifle and this is the opening of gen 4 logic gen 4 logic is independent 3d garnish mastery and then you go back to thinking about the base layer is it the right base layer or not and once you superpose you add up the base layer and the 3d garnish you have an interaction and that is what gen 4 is about Hi. Hi, how are you, my friend? I'm fine. Can you tell us, please, why were you so unsatisfied with the three first generations of Gillies? It's very simple. It's because I had no control over the pattern. You need pattern control. You need to choose the shape, the color, the reflectance, and the volume. And only then can you become the master of pattern composition. When I was uh, serving in the military, I have undergone a special training for camouflage and uh, multispectral camouflage. And the main tool was this kind of net. So I was puzzled. Why did they give us this fantastic multispectral material to camo our Humvees? But when we had to camouflage ourselves, we were told to rely on Gen 1 ghillies that were absolutely not usable in a recon context. So I began making suits with this netting, but there were two problems. The first, that I didn't control the pattern. For instance, there were these awful black, black spots, uh, which are counterproductive. 
not realistic. And the other thing was the snagging issue. Every tank driver knows this is this is hell, and 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 if you drive through a forest with your Leopard 2, it it will tear apart, and it's just just nonsense. So I quickly came to the conclusion that I had to cut cut pieces of this to emancipate myself from this awful fishnetting structure and get the juice out of it with the nice nice green mustard reflectance material. The next step was to attach the 3D garnish, the 3D material to a base layer and of course I didn't want to use any glue any sewing and other knots so the answer was the zip tie and this is why the zip tie was is and will be the the centerpiece of uh, gen 4 modular camouflage paradigm and it's very easy because it's durable you just have to attach it and there you go and you have resolved the snagging problem as this is non-snagging and it's it's uh, easy it's fast and it's also very easy to undo because you can just cut it and undo your system and modify everything so once again the zip tie was uh, was a revolution now everybody is using my method but back in the days I gave uh, France Airsoft, the Airsoft Forum, one year to guess how am I attaching my 3D. And after one year, they, they still weren't able to guess it. Uh, for those who remember, like Doggy or uh, Gilly One, Yanni, they remember this, uh, these days from uh, 2010, 2012. Here we go. This is the essence of Gen 4. But what can we do if uh, you don't have a mesh base layer and if you want to attach 3D directly to, uh, to a uniform or any other relevant base layer, 2D base layer? Well, you have to punch a hole. It's very easy. Take a spike, two or three millimeters wide and insert the zip tie. So uh, it was a bit scandalous when I asked operators to uh, to punch holes in their cry precision uh, UF Pro or UR tactical gear, and some may even think this is this is damaging gear. It's not damaging; it's upgrading. If you're not ready to upgrade yourself to a Gen 4 paradigm, you will have to use mesh. And this methodology also applies to Molly. Because you can transform your backpack, your mag pouch, uh, your plate carrier into a 3D asset. So you can transform basically all kinds of gear into ghillies, into Gen 4 ghillies. As far as 3D elements are concerned, the methodology is always the same, whether you're in the snow, in the jungle, in the desert, somewhere in between make sure you have 3d relevant relevant to the dominant color for instance dry earth here and always make a 360 degrees turn I have to say something that uh, you will not believe and you will not apply but but it has to be said um, when uh, mastering 3D camouflage techniques you absolutely need to spend more time on observation than on composition. This is why I never use the term ghillie crafting because crafting is maybe like 5% of the time you're supposed to uh, devote to your ghillie system. It's like with uh, tactics marksmanship matters but if you have only marksmanship and no tactics it will not work 
So uh, here we are, observing. Invest time in observation. Uh, certain years, like 2008, 2009, uh, I, I haven't crafted anything, but I have observed, 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 field tested, field tested, field tested. And this is where the knowledge comes from. Please do the same if you want to improve. And the observation phase is a good excuse to be in the wilderness, outdoors. It's also a good opportunity to improve, improve your cardio if you're smart enough to wear a backpack, uh, train topography, uh, orientation, land navigation, everything. So this is not only about wasting time uh, with, with camouflage uh, in, in, in the woods, okay? This is also mental, physical, spiritual, everything. So <clears throat> the first step during the observation phase is to find a spot that you think is representative. It represents a highly probable spot for you to hide. And this is the junction between uh, stealth behavior and, and uh, camouflage um, paradigm. So I see a very nice place here. You see the, the, the tree that's, uh, that's uh, right there, this gray tree. And the second one to the right, we have a spot with leaves, grass, very nice angle. So this is a good place for our field testing. Let's go. All right. So now listen up and listen closely because this is the most fundamental moment of the fundamentals. It's like shooting, skiing, racing, everything. You never end up and you're never done with uh, learning fundamentals. So do your field testing at noon. So is it noon? Yeah, more or less. Because this is when you have the sun in the right angle and your shade indicates the, the axis of observation. This is the zero degree axis. Everything here will be to the left. Everything there will be to the right. This will be below and this will be overhead. So now you have to move away and the more distance you have, the more knowledge you will gather. Observation phase. Distance, 25 meters. Observation phase. Distance, 100 meters. Observation phase. Distance, 200 meters. Okay, now it's the final distance because I cannot move any further. There's a, there's a cliff behind me, so uh, 220 meters, what do we see? We see that it blends in, it performs. So the test is failed from an observation point of view. Uh, why? Failed? I thought it was a success if it blends in. From a practical point of view it's a success, but from an observation point of view it's a failure. Because, you know, you know the saying, it goes, uh, amateurs train until they do it right, professionals train until they get it wrong. So this is what we're doing here, we're professionals. So I could have, could have said the, the observation is, is void or uh, non-valid or something, but no, I think, yes, it is, but it's failed at the same time because there is nothing to correct. It works. It blends in. It works. So, what would be the next step? The next step is to find another representative spot that will be more difficult, where it will not work. If you remember, this thing has been sprayed, has been created, I mean the, the 2D has been created in the woods, in the woodland, and now it's an open terrain. 
and it also works actually honestly i didn't expect it to work but it works okay so it was a good uh, intuition i had because the reflectance is right the colors are, are right so it works but i have to find something more difficult and if i go in a completely different environment like like say uh 100 green it will not work and this is when the next phase comes in is what i called hedging hedging like in hedge funds like in your investment portfolio uh you don't want to risk put all your eggs in the same basket if the the bastards go bankrupt you lose your money so you have to hedge so uh, uh adding some green for instance in case it gets more green or adding darker colors in case you have uh, more contrast and this is where it gets really interesting is when you hedge because every every layer of pattern that you add corresponds to a hedge to a hedging layer so sometimes people uh, see my camouflage and they say oh but uh, there is no macro pattern oh i have done a good job because they don't see the macro pattern and maybe you have very often five or six overlapping macro patterns and each one of them fucks up their brain and they don't see it so this is proof it works now you see still the right methodology my shade is indicating pointing towards the target i mean not the target the the object the the experiment the prototype shall i say yeah the prototype here's our dear prototype and the 3d phase has not begun we're just doing the 2d so i will not do hedging with 2d because it would mean spraying with green no 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 this is where 3D becomes uh, relevant, we will add green 3D and other colors. Now, we are in the field and I always recommend to do your pattern composition in the field, in C2, as we say in Latin, because it's the only way to uh, to be 100% sure that it's relevant. Even after uh, 17 years, I'm never sure. So step one, take a relevant base layer. Uh, for instance, this uh, Pencott baseball cap, it's a bit dirty and uh, the base layer is not, the white is not white enough. You see, it could be, uh, could be uh, more intense. I have a higher reflectance because snow has a super high reflectance so the first step is to have a base layer that blends in with the dominant color so the dominant color here is is already white nevertheless you have brown green and other stuff but first the dominant color so you go from the dominant to the to the most exotic colors and we have to break up this this hat with more intense white to break up its silhouette and this will be the layer one of the algorithm the algorithm is the the sequency of of uh, of steps of adding 3d you have to remember it or record it or make pictures and then when you're back in the workshop you just have to repeat it on a bigger scale mm, that's the reason why i i uh, advise you to begin with small surfaces and in the field it doesn't doesn't make sense to make an entire ghillie in the field because you will be better home watching uh, some uh, some movies or listening to audiobooks while you make your your uh, 3D composition. Okay, so let's go, layer one. All right, so now layer one is done, and you see it's more white and it performs better in, uh, in actual snow than the, the 2D by itself. And if you want, now you can go for, a, for an observation phase to see how it works. For example, 
on the branch there. We see that the, the white spots work and do their job. And obviously now it would be cool to get some green. So let's go for the second layer, which will be green. And nota bene, please observe that I can exactly choose where I want to insert my zip tie. And I can even choose the angle because attaching like this is not the same as attaching like this, obviously. And this is pattern control. Not only can I choose the color, but I can choose where I put the color and at which angle I put the color and I don't want it to hinder my vision. You can, you decide everything, you control everything. This is called pattern control and pattern control is the essence of modular 3D methodology. And uh, now I think you're getting to understand my paradigm. So let's, uh, let's apply the, the green 3D. The green 3D I have chosen here. Some elements are positive space elements, positive space materials, and others are negative space materials. You see, the they're like almost transparent and the, the edges are not so uh, well defined. It's not as sharp. So we have... Uh, green positive space and green negative space through the elements. Fine, so here we are. We have layer two, the green layer that is in. And if you want, you can go for, a, for an observation round. And you see, now this is the essence of, of uh, deliberate practice. I'm at uh, almost 21 steps away and can I detect it? Yes. Can I identify it? Unfortunately, yes. So the, the white works perfectly. The green works just as well. But unfortunately, I can still detect the, the base layer. So I have to further break the base layer with with some brown because this is what's missing now let's get closer and the process is over when at 21 steps you're not capable of detecting it meaning that you see it you know it's there you know what it is but you cannot recognize it it's it, you you know it's there just because you put it there but the, honestly, you see that you couldn't detect it nor identify it from 21 steps away. And if it's the case from 21 steps away, your kang works. And then you try to, be, to get the same level of, of satisfaction from eight steps away, which is, oh, which is here, okay? So now we see that uh, we have to break, break it more. And it's just because the, the pen cut is not, not white enough. Okay, so the first two layers work. Now let's go for layer three. Fine, layer three has been applied, and you see that it begins to uh, to disappear the um, the breakup effect is is uh, more obvious. So now let's add some of my uh, nano screen and do some some observation as usual. Let's uh, look at this dry boonie hat in the middle of wet leaves. And you see the wet leaves are much darker and the boonie hat appears to be too bright. So let's use our low-tech rain simulator. 
and you see the nano screen does the job it adapts right away to the wet environment so the whole idea is to get dark as fast as possible without excessive increase of weight and most importantly to dry as fast as possible and you want the green to remain green but you want the brown to get dark this is why hedging is so important and hedging is not only a matter of hedging colors or reflectance it's also a matter of hedging contrast and hedging contrast comes down to hedging size i mean the size of the the 3d elements because if you tend to um, have big 3d elements you take more risk in case they're not relevant they will cause contrast which will end up in detection on the other hand if you are smart enough to accept that sometimes a 3d element that is too small is actually the one that will be less risky you will understand that this gives you much more safety so for instance the the 3d elements that um, emulate the oak oak leaves to emulate oak leaves you have to purchase my nano screen oak master garlands it's the best solution on the market and you see when i move away i can still enjoy this cobra as a stand-up pattern even though i have lost some performance as a prone pattern had i uh, attached bigger oak master garland pieces it would have been better in the prone position but the price to pay would be super high absurdly costly because it would not perform in a stand-up position anymore okay because you never see forest floor standing up so this is a mistake all beginners uh, and, and don't even think about they want to be a piece of forest floor that stands up and you see this absurd uh, uh, what was the name sneaky leaf decorative camouflage what I call they take uh, figurative decorative elements and expect to make a uh, camouflage with it it's not camouflage it's it's artificial cover-up it's the worst thing you can do so uh, once again you see this works as a stand-up pattern because i i will not be prone all the time sometimes you have to move and once again there's a trade-off a trade-off a cruel sad grim trade-off between cover-up and mobility fools choose cover-up professionals choose camouflage because they know it guarantees mobility and bear in mind that in the modular 3d paradigm convenience and comfort are more important than performance you don't want your ghillie to be too hot so i would recommend such a high density ghillie suit in the winter time but i would not wear this in the summer 
And if your ghillie suit doesn't fit in your backpack, it doesn't make sense. All right, folks, so let's sum up this uh, introduction to the modular 3D paradigm. As you have seen, first of all, you have to get a good base layer that has to work even when it's wet and have a pattern that's reliable because no matter how good your 3D is, if the base layer is not relevant, you will be disappointed. Even if you cover it up with 3D, there will always be something sticking out. And uh, on the opposite, if you have the best 2D in the world, you can still screw it up with lousy 3D. But if both are relevant, you achieve transparency. It's it's the highest level of performance is when it seems that you're beginning to be transparent, when everything works, everything performs. And this is what we're trying to achieve with the Gen 4 Gillies. So you can consider that the, the 2D is negative space and the 3D is positive space. It's not always the case, but this is a, an excellent way to, uh, to begin pattern composition and understanding modular 3D paradigm. If, you're, if the reflectance of your base layer and the reflectance of your 3D garnish are complementary, you will not only have transparency, but you will have continuity, like uh, on this picture, continuity with the forest floor, for example. But performance is not uh, everything. Actually, convenience and comfort are even more important. You see, if uh, you play airsoft and you spend five, six hours in a lousy ghillie suit, it's not a problem. But if you spend five or six days stealth hiking, doing uh, bushcraft, you will notice that you want pockets, uh, elbow, knee reinforcements, and everything has to be performant. And this is what I understood 10 years ago. You see, this is a picture from 2012 with my Caramor Chameleon. I added the best 3D. I did what I could, but I never achieved transparency nor continuity because it was a 2D. Uh, so even if it's the best 2D, because Caramor Chameleon's SF was infrared, uh, compliant, blah, 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 everything. But at the end of the day, I tried for an entire, the end of the season, actually, I, 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 I tried for an entire winter season to do something with it, and it didn't work. So then I tried during the summer by adding green 3D, and it still didn't work because... I didn't control the pattern. This is how I understood what pattern control is, is because of this damn chameleon. Uh, the black spots. The thing that a 2D is a, a, a Gen 2 is a 2D that tries to perform in a in, in three-dimensional uh, realm. But it's impossible. It's impossible. So I gave up and began using rational base layers, like the one on the left here. You see how the macro pattern macro pattern cuts the the model in two or the other one on the right hand side which looks like uh, like the bark of the tree behind so by choosing a good base layer that you control it will make things much easier and you can achieve incredible performance if you use for instance uh pen cut and you just let breathe the parts that perform and cover the ones that do not perform, you get an interaction between 2D and 3D. And you can achieve this only via my paradigm, by using zip ties, and by making sure everything is relevant. This was a revolution back in 2010. There was no realistic camouflage on the market, not from a color point of view, not from a, a shape point of view, and you see, this is another excellent 2D I bought uh, like 
15 years ago, but you can see that on the right hand side, something is much better because you can get control over the shape of what you're emulating and you decide, not some engineer who's working for some commercial cash grab who just wants to sell as much camo as possible and they want to have the highest margin possible. Gen 4 is you taking control of the industrial process, of the composition process, and of the assembly process. And this is why you will uh, achieve much greater comfort, much greater performance by applying my modular 3D paradigm. And then uh, around 2017, I understood that positive space 3D materials were not enough, so I developed Halo Screen, which you see here in the first test. So it works not only in leaves, but also in grass and in mixed environments such as this one, where you have grass, leaves, very tricky light conditions, and Halo Screen solved this problem. As you know, uh, with the Gen 4 uh, Gillies, you can control the pattern even in the smallest details. You can uh, achieve things that were unthinkable or that were only dreamt of but were not uh, not achievable in reality and this applies to rocks to arid areas uh, to flat uh, flat terrain rocky terrain sand desert high altitude mountains and you can apply it to gear so uh, making making a backpack making a pouch, a battle belt, a plate carrier was the, the new standard that, that I had to set in uh, 2010. And you don't want to rely on the vegetation, as I told you before. This is why, whether it's with positive space or negative space materials, you can achieve very good concealment in summer, in the jungle, without using vegetation. So uh, you will be able to be on the move without compromising mobility and you will disappear. Still, you will uh, be able to uh, manage humidity, high grow specifications. And uh, another thing that matters is that when you wear a Gen 4 ghillie, you can still apply your uh, CQB drills, your CQB procedures. This is something I wanted because uh, when you train uh, your shooting drills and you're not able to perform it because you're wearing a ghillie, what sense does it make? You're not going to retrain or question the entire CQB paradigm just because you're wearing a ghillie. So you want your mag to be where your mag is supposed to be. You want your belt to be where your belt is supposed to be. And, and, and everything has to be uh, tactical. I know this word is, is, is used too much. And the, the ability, ability to go from a, from a prone uh, position where people are almost uh, stepping on you because you're so well camouflaged to standing up and beginning a regular assault is uh, is a plus. This applies to guns, to rifles. You can have them very flat with 2D, 3D. You can have mid-density uh, 3D or you can uh, decide that uh, manipulation is not the most important and that you want full 3D uh, more in a, in a less professional way. That's it, folks. It's getting late, it's getting dark, and it's time to go to sleep. Now you know what the Gen 4 Ghillie is. And if you liked it, please click like, subscribe, and if you want, 
I will make a second episode regarding pattern composition. Good night. Oh, one last thing. No matter what they say, no matter what they think, stay covert. <laughs>